So good afternoon. My name is Don Lee. I'm the executive director of Ann Arbor for Public Power. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us for this roundtable event. Public Power is Climate Action from Maine to Michigan and beyond. Before we begin the program, before we begin the program, uh, to give a very brief explanation of public power compared to what we have now. The two primary differences are ownership of the utility and how ratepayer money is used. Businesses and residents of Ann Arbor currently receive their power from DTE. Most of you know this because every month you send them money for your electric bill. DTE is an investor owned utility company, which means they are primarily accountable to their shareholders and not to the public interest. DT is, uh, has serious reliability problems because they prioritize using your dollars to enrich shareholders at the expense of maintaining the grid. Has anybody out here been affected by one or more power outages this year? I thought that might get a giggle. These outages uh, cost businesses and families in Ann Arbor hundreds of thousands of dollars per year, and there's no mechanism to hold DTE accountable. Public power, on the other hand, means our homes and businesses run on electricity that's provided by a not-for-profit, community-owned utility. And in this case, we are proposing a municipal utility with the core mission of providing electricity not as an investment for shareholder profits, but as a service provided to local citizens, governed by and accountable to local citizens. There are over 2,000 utilities in the United States serving 49 million people that are owned by communities. In contrast to investor-owned utilities like DTE, Public power entities are democratically governed, often better, have better reliability, are overwhelmingly more affordable, allow for and fairly compensate customer-owned solar, and in the process create local economic development opportunities. Public power returns the power to the people, literally, giving us control of our energy future in the face of catastrophic climate change. On behalf of myself and Ann Arbor for Public Power, I would like to thank you for your interest in public power, and we hope that you find today's roundtable discussion interesting, informative, and energizing. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Arun Agarwal. Thank you, Don. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I am a newbie to A2P2, but I'm very excited and very interested in doing everything I can to support A2P2. Many of you come to A2P2 because of climate. Some of you come to it because of renewable energy. Some of you come to it because it promises to provide more sustainable, more reliable, and more renewable energy. I come to it for a very different reason. To my mind, no transformation, no change is possible if we rely for change on the same old cliched actors that have brought us to this crisis. But just to say, I believe that for transformation to happen, we have to work together. I come to it through the metaphor of commoning, through the idea of commoning. What is commoning? Commoning is collective effort on the basis of reciprocity and agreed upon rules to create shared infrastructure and shared resources. To my mind, A2P2 is a shining example of commoning. And I love the fact that in my town, in my university, A2P2 is holding this event and promising to bring about change because that's the kind of change we need. With this, I would like to hand over to Greg. Thank you, Dr. Agarwald. My name is Greg Woodring. I'm the president of Ann Arbor for Public Power. I'm so proud to be here with all of you today. We've got a fantastic event. I'm not gonna take up too much of your time. Uh, Next up, we are going to have a bit of a mini keynote from uh, Christy McGregor, uh, a uh, leader in the Sierra Club at the state level. Um, and then we are going to be going into a fantastic discussion with our panelists. After our discussion with our panelists, we are going to go into a Q&A section. If you have not already had the opportunity, we do have opportunities to submit questions for that, both on the live stream for those watching and here in person. Um, and we'll be able to ask our panelists any other questions that you may have. So please be thinking of those as we're going throughout the program so that we can have that kind of robust discussion. But without further ado, Christy McGillivray. Thanks, Greg. Um, thanks, everyone. I'm glad that you're here. 
Um, you know, I was as I was thinking about what to share with all of you, um, I started thinking about um, the organization 350.org. And when I first met Bill McKibben, um, it was 2004, it was in Detroit, and he was in town to introduce this organization that he had founded um, to make sure that we didn't actually get above 350 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. So today we're closing in on 420. Um, time's up. We have to fix this and we have to fix it now. Um, the good news is that there's a lot of really good stuff that's happening. We are investing billions of dollars in retooling our economy to invest in renewable energy. That is going to happen. We have leaders at the state level that are making sure that we spend that money the right way. And I think there is political consensus that we actually have to invest in renewable energy. I don't think that there's political consensus that we have to stop using fossil fuels. Those are actually two different things. So as we electrify transportation and housing, oil companies are ramping up production in new sectors. They want to expand plastics production, they want to expand the waste energy sector, and they want to expand into ag, agriculture. So we have to make sure that we're continuing to fight hard to actually put a stop to the way that fossil fuel companies have held our political system hostage. And we do that by making sure we strengthen democracy. Here in Ann Arbor, that is exactly what you're doing by investing in a campaign to get public power and public control of your utility. That's exactly what we have to do to actually stop using fossil fuels. And I'm really excited to hear about how it's happening. All right. Um... So now we are going to move into our panel discussion. Uh, before we move uh, directly into our panel discussion, I do just want to call out and thank the elected officials that we have here with us tonight. Uh, Jason Morgan, State Representative for Ann Arbor. And Ernesto Carey Harrow, Ann Arbor School Board. Um, Dr. Agarwald and I will be the uh, moderators for today's discussion. We will be asking the questions uh, and we have our four fantastic panelists. Uh, to start off, I'm going to ask Michelle Dietrich, Chair of the Democratic National Committee's Council on Climate Crisis and the Environment, if I have that uh, name correct, and uh, countless champion in many other ways. So uh, thank you so much. It on. Oh, great. It's on and you got it right. That uh, name is a little bit of a mouthful. Um, I am so glad to be here today. I, I can't really think of a more important conversation to be having in this place and in this time because we are not facing a climate tipping point. We have passed one. And I think this summer really attests to that. Um, extreme heat, rising temperatures, floods, uh, extreme ocean temperatures, raging wildfires that are cost lives, um, the floods in Libya, which are partly climate fueled, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, so my name's Michelle Dietrich, and for the past three years, I've been the chair of the Democratic National Committee's Council on the Environment and Climate Crisis. Um, and it's a council I started because I wanted to make sure that the Democratic Party was sure to face climate and environmental justice issues front and center every step of the way, up ballot, down ballot, local level, state level, and federally. Um, and while the council does a lot of vital work that I'm really proud of, I think the thing I'm most proud of and that I think is turning out to be most effective is building out a network of state and local Democratic Party environmental councils. Because what happens at the grassroots level is, and at the local level, as we see here, is so absolutely vital. Um, so, and you know, I'm an organizer. Um, organizing is what I do. It's what I'm doing at the council. Um, I did it as a former elected official. I've done it as a longtime uh, labor union member and as a longtime advocate in our state. So it's through that lens of the environment and labor um, and organizing that I came to become such a fervent advocate for public power. Um, it's a win-win-win. It's, you're gonna hear this over and over because it's so true. It's more affordable, it's more reliable, and it can be greener. And by the way, I guess our fourth, 
it's more accountable to the people. So um, it's about people, communities, and planet, and I'm so glad to be here with the great panelists, other great panelists. Hi, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Irwin. I had the great honor to talk to him with a colleague of mine a few days ago, and I was blown away by how articulate, how confident, how thoughtful he was in the conversation. Jeff. <laughs> so lest you think that Jeff is distinguished by that, in fact, the much more distinguished part of Jeff is that he's a U of M graduate. So welcome, and thank you, Jeff, for joining us today. Please say a few words. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Agarwal, and thank you all for being here and for the very generous uh, introduction. I am Jeff Irwin. I'm uh, likely your state senator. I share uh, Washtenaw County with Senator Schenck. Um, who's been a great ally on environmental protection in Lansing. Uh, and so, uh, look, I got involved with Ann Arbor for Public Power several years ago uh, when, uh, you know, folks started asking about, you know, why is it that so many people around this country have public power and we don't? Why is it that half of the country enjoys cheaper, cleaner, more reliable and more accountable, thank you, power. Uh, why is it that there are 40 plus communities in Michigan that enjoy cheaper, cleaner, more accountable, more reliable power? And we don't here in Ann Arbor. And, um, you know, when Greg reached out to me to ask those questions, you know, I said immediately that, look, this is something that we can and should do here. This is an opportunity that we've been missing. And as somebody who's been in the state legislature uh, fighting against the, the Republicans and, you know, the Green Party, the money in Lansing that makes it so hard to get something done on the environmental protection, uh, you know, I immediately realized that this is an opportunity for us here in Ann Arbor to not have to wait for the politics of Lansing to get sorted out in order to make a real difference on climate. We don't have to wait for Lansing to make a real difference on democracy and accountability and reliability for our residents. We don't have to wait for Lansing to make sure that seniors who are struggling with rising utility bills and a fixed income get some relief. We can do this here in Ann Arbor and we can have public power. And it's gonna be a tough long fight, but. That's why we need to start that fight yesterday. And that's why we need you, if you haven't already, to join that fight today. Because ultimately, we can have cheaper, cleaner, more reliable power if we work together, right? So uh, before I get there, I just want to say why, just generally, I think we can have cheaper, cleaner, more reliable power with a public authority. If, firstly, it's because when you look at all the municipal authorities across state, that's what they have. But also there are some intuitive reasons that I just want to lay on you so that when you're talking with your friends and neighbors and fellow community residents, you can share some of these thoughts with them. Whenever we run a utility system, there is cross subsidization. Let me give you an example. Right now we have a public water authority. We have a public water company here in Ann Arbor. And if anybody talked about selling at the DTE, people would be in the streets. But with that public water company, if you live right next to the, the, the water plant, you pay the same rate as someone who lives across town. And the same thing happens in our, in our electric utility. We here in Ann Arbor pay the same rate as somebody in Monroe who's right next to the power plant. We pay the same rate as someone up in Bad Axe who's very, very far from where the energy is generated. And so I say that to share with you that one of the things we have here in Ann Arbor is we have one of the densest areas in the entire state to serve. With density comes efficiency. With efficiency comes lower cost. And it also plays out in the same way with reliability. We had some huge storms that hit us recently, right? And uh, those storms hit Lansing really, really hard. Those storms that actually hit Lansing harder than Washtenaw County, hit Lansing harder than it hit Southeast Michigan. And Lansing customers also, a lot of them lost power. But you know what? They had 100% of their customers back online very, very quickly, much more quickly than DTE. Why? Because they don't have to run all over the thumb. They don't have to run around places like Bad Axe all the way down to Lenaway to try to fix it. They know where their lines are. It's a dense, efficient area. They've got a lot of rate payers. They got a lot of eyes on it. And they're able to put the appropriate maintenance staff in the field to cover that territory more easily. So those are a couple of intuitive reasons why public power just tends to be cheaper, cleaner, more reliable. There are other reasons like cost of capital. There, you know, there, there are lots of reasons why, but those are some that you can share with your residents. And the biggest thing that I hear from people in town who are queasy about this idea, 
the biggest pushback I hear is that while well, DTE has all of this old infrastructure, all these old lines in town, do we really want to buy all of this old infrastructure? I hear that a lot from folks who are unsure about the opportunity of having public power here in Ann Arbor. And what I say to them is, I would encourage you to think about this just like you would about the decision whether or not to rent versus to buy. The practical reality is that when you rent, you still pay for it. You just don't own it at the end of the day. And in any situation where you're in it for the long term, it usually makes sense to buy. That's when you can really make the investments and fix it this old dilapidated infrastructure. If we don't buy it, if we don't acquire it and take accountability for it and fix it, we're gonna pay for it anyway and be left with nothing in the end. Ownership of nothing, having fixed nothing and continuing to rely on this utility who has not just been letting us down with reliability by cutting maintenance staff to boost profits, but they've also been fighting folks like us for decades and folks like you, some of you in the audience who've been fighting against pollution and climate change for even longer than we have. They've been fighting us in Lance, they've been fighting us in Washington, DC, and it's time that we take that fight here to Ann Arbor. And the way we win at the end of the day is eventually this has to go on the ballot and the people of, people of Ann Arbor have to make a decision. And the Michigan constitution stipulates that we have the right to make that decision, but it also stipulates that in order for us to win, we have to get a 60% majority. That's going to be hard. And that's why it's so important that you're here today. That's why it's so important that you join Ann Arbor Public Power, that you share their messages with your friends and neighbors, that you that you have this discussion with your leaders, in, in, your elected leaders in the city and in the county, and that we um, we organize. We need to organize, and then we need to keep organizing to make sure that everybody hears this message, that we can have cheaper, cleaner, more reliable power, that it's within our reach, and that in order for us to do it, we all have to come together on a particular general election ballot and vote yes, 60% of us plus. So thank you for being willing to engage in that work. Thank you for being willing to engage your curiosity to learn more about this. And I'm super excited about the opportunity that this presents for our residents here in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm I, I'm inspired. Are you? <laughs> Just really, I mean, I'm realizing that when you are listening to Jeff, you have to set your bar really high, and he will still surprise you with how good he is. Thank you. Uh, I have not until today met Yusuf, and I am both excited and grateful for the opportunity to see you here and to talk with you and to hear you. Yusuf is the uh, commissioner for District A for uh, for Ann Arbor Board of uh, for Washtenaw County. And before that, he represented uh, uh, Ann Arbor in, in, the, in the state legislature. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Round of applause to all of you for being here, first of all. This is a great turnout. It's amazing to see so many people here in this room. And I, I am standing today because I uh, went to program in the environment and I had a lot of classes in this building and I love the Dana building because it's a beautiful historic building, but this, but the, yeah, go blue, that's right. But this room kind of sucks because these pillars, I can't see some of your faces and I want to see everybody's face when I'm talking. Uh, the downside is, is you don't get to see my cat socks. This is my cat and she supports public power. So yes, she supports public power. So I'm really honored to be here with all of you. Um, I have to say, the reason that I believe that this is our solution is because I spent six years in the legislature. Jason's getting a taste of what I mean by that. Jeff has uh, a deep understanding of what I mean by that. But the reality is, is if, if, we, if you're putting your money on waiting on the legislature to take action, you you might as well just prepare for the end of the world because it's not happening anytime soon, okay? That having been said, that does not mean we let the legislature off the hook, okay? And I'm gonna give a plug right now for Bentley's here from the League of Conservation Voters. I know we have Christy with Sierra Club. There's a rally in Lansing that you should go to on the 26th. GMAT Cash is gonna be there. I don't know if you need anything else, but like, yeah, rally, we need to pressure the state legislature. They do need to take action. But 
after six years of being there and seeing the flow of money in our political process, the thousands upon hundreds of thousands upon millions of dollars that our utilities spend on controlling our legislative process, on making sure that our legislators tow their line and not the people's line. It is real. And I'll be honest with you, when I got to Lansing, I was bright eyed, bushy tailed. I thought politics wasn't as bad as everybody says it is. And Jason, worse. It's worse. It's worse. I mean, and let's just be like, I'm just being honest with you guys, right? I'm a very like under the hood kind of guy. This is how it works, right? Money moves Lansing. And unfortunately, the utilities have a ton of it. But how many people in this room, when you pay your utility bills, how many people in this room want your money to go to lobbyists and lobby expenditures to end any bills relating to climate change? Raise your hand if you want your money to go to that from your bill. Raise your hand if you would like a portion, a large significant portion of your bill to go to Wall Street profits. Raise your hand if that's what you, if that's what you're paying for. When you pay your bill, is that what you're paying for? Anybody in the room? No? Wow, I'm surprised, honestly. I, I would think more people would want, you know, to fill the pockets of corporate executives that are making $15 million. I would think that more people would want to just send their money to Wall Street, right? No, I guess not. Okay. How many people want their utility bills to be spent on making sure you can actually turn the lights on in your house? Please raise your hand. How many of you want your utility bills to make to fund our grid and make sure that your yards don't catch fire or the transformers don't blow up in the back in your backyard when the wind even blows a little bit or a squirrel decides to go crazy? Yeah, raise your hands if that's what you want the money to be used for. Okay. If those are the things that you want, and you don't want your money to go to profits, this is the only solution. We need to create a municipal utility. We need to take our power back. We cannot wait for Lansing. We cannot wait for the utilities. They will tell you all kinds of flowery things. We're trying to move to cleaner energy. We're gonna be carbon neutral by 2050. It's all lies and it's all in the fine print. They are not telling you the truth. They are continuing to invest in carbon energy production, and they are not stopping anytime soon. This is a big money industry that we are up against, but in the history of humanity, it is popular and people-oriented movements that have overcome. And even when we are facing great odds, even when there are big money dollars and well-paid CEOs behind the opposition, it is groups like this of people that come together and join shoulder to shoulder to fight for what is right, to take our power back for the people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yusuf Rabi. For those inspiring words. Always a fantastic show. And I appreciate you being a fantastic <laughs> And now I'm extremely honored to introduce a uh, former state representative of Maine, Seth Berry. Seth has been leading the Our Power Maine and Pine Tree Power movement in Maine. And that movement has been an incredible inspiration to us here in Ann Arbor. For those who do not know, the state of Maine is currently considering taking their entire state to public power. And Seth can tell you that story better than I can, but it is on the ballot this November, and if they do that, that will set off a domino chain across this country, moving towards the direction that we know it needs to go. So coming to us from Maine, flying through a hurricane today, I'm pleased to introduce Seth Berry. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, I did. I did get here uh, from Maine, although it was uh, by the time uh, it, uh, it it hit Nova Scotia, it really was just a tropical storm in Maine, and I was able to take a, a bus to Boston and uh, and get here. Lauren has been kind enough to put me up, and uh, the question earlier about ha has DT a DTE outage affected you recently is true for me. On our way here, 
um, on a major multi-lane avenue, um, we needed to take a left turn and the traffic light was not working. And lo and behold, there were six DTE trucks uh, there attempting to fix it, obviously not having a lot of success. And so in less than 24 hours, I, I know what you're up against. Um, it is so, it's such an honor to be here with all of you. I find A2P2 an incredible inspiration, um, a real leader, a real opportunity. I have huge faith in what you all can accomplish. And that's what brought me here. We have 51 days left in Maine and we are canvassing and we're sending postcards and we're making calls and we're uh, making donations and we're sending text messages and doing all the things, right? But I'm here with you because it's not just about Maine and it's not just about Ann Arbor. It's about the whole friggin' world. And we do have to do this together. You know, Maine um, has a pretty good portfolio. If you look at our sort of overall emissions, um, our, our green, greenhouse gas emissions, only 7% of them can be attributed to our electricity use. So some people say, what's the problem, right? Why, why do we need to, you know, take back our power? Why do we need to confront our utilities? They seem to be doing well. Well, guess what? There's six billion a year that's being spent on fossil fuels. There's 54% of our emissions from transportation, 30% from uh, building heating and cooling, 9% from factories. And we have to electrify all of that. Our lives and our livelihoods will depend on a single wire running down the road. And that wire is, 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 is literally the lifeline to a livable planet for all of us. And it connects us. The wire system, except for Texas, because they think they're better. The wire system actually literally connects from here all the way to Maine, right? And from here all the way to California. You can get there from here. Um, and, and that system needs to be about three and a half, at least in Maine, we've crunched the numbers, about three and a half times as robust as it is now, just to carry the juice to decarbonize, to power our transportation fleet, to heat and cool our buildings, to power our factories. Three and a half times the investment in the grid that we have made to date. I'm just talking about the grid here. You know, generation is a whole other thing. We need to really ramp that up as well. But um, the proposal in Maine, which I'll talk about more in a minute, is just for the poles and wires. We have separated uh, generation from and and uh, and storage from transmission. So we're really just talking about the grid. That's a monopoly system. It is absolutely the lifeline to our, our future. And we have to think about how we're going to not only make it more robust, but also harden it against extreme weather. I heard you had some tornadoes in the region recently. Yousef was telling me about that. That's new, right? Hurricanes don't usually show up in Maine, and yet here we are. So we expect a lot more severe weather in the very near future. And guess what? Our, we have to be able to handle that. Our grid has to be able to handle that. So more investment. And we can do this the way we are now. For every dollar that the shareholders of DTE or CMP, where I am, spend, we pay them back that dollar over 20 years and another dollar on top of it and typically some more to boot. So, you know, you know, we can pay 210 for every dollar, give or take. Um, sometimes it's as high as three, they get adder sometimes. That's how we're doing it now. Or we can be smart and we can pay back the dollar plus 30 or 40 cents. And this is how public utilities are financed. Truly public utilities are financed. Cooperatives also. So it's it should be a no-brainer business decision, right? But the problem is that the, the consumer-owned utilities are going about their business and focusing on their customers, the munis, the cooperatives. Meanwhile, the investor-owned utilities, they don't have to act like other businesses. They don't have to compete for customers. They don't have to do a better job for us, right? How do they make more money? They play the influence game better. And that's why they are so good in Maine, as in Michigan, and the rest of the country as well, at playing, at, at lobbying, at lawyering, at greasing the palms, you know, we saw scandals in Ohio and Illinois recently. There was actual bribery of House speakers. One was a Democrat, another was a Republican, right? They're bipartisan, but they will grease the palms. This is literally how they make their money is by playing the influence game better. There's, there's really no way they can make better money by competing for customers because we're all captives anyway. So we need to free ourselves of that system. It is fundamentally broken. And, and the only way that we can do that, I came to realize over my seven terms in the legislature of Maine, was to take back our power. And it's a, it's a little known but important fact that pu the, the whole regulatory bargain, the whole existence of, of these private utilities and the monopolies that they have, was it originated 
from the industry a little over 100 years ago, the early 1900s. They said, how are we going to get monopolies? How, how can we make sure there's a monopoly? So we don't have to compete with each other. Well, we'll go and lobby the legislators around the, around the states, and we'll get them to enact a bargain where they have these commissions, and they can be involved in rate setting, and in return, we'll get a monopoly. And that's what happened. It was the utilities themselves that invented the system we have now. So studying that, um, being very frustrated with our utilities in uh, Maine as the chair of the uh, Committee on Energy, as the House Majority Leader, um, beating my head against the wall because climate was the most important thing to me. And here was these, these utilities were the big problem. I realized that we needed to make a change. I realized that it, it wasn't actually, in my case, it wasn't the fossil fuel companies that were lobbying against us. It was the utilities on which we depended for our lives and livelihoods. So that drove me to where, I, where we are today. And just quickly, um, I, wanna, I wanna tell you that I looked around the country and I saw the communities that were leading on clean energy. There were six, thanks to the Sierra Club, I learned that there were six communities across the US that had achieved 100% renewable electricity by 2017. By the time Trump was elected, they were already there. And I said, what do they have in common? This is crazy. Burlington, Vermont, Aspen, Colorado. Okay, that makes sense. They're you know kind of liberal communities. All right. And then I go down the list. Um, Georgetown, Texas. Hmm. Greensburg, Kansas. That's odd. Rockport, Missouri. Also Republican area. Kodiak, Alaska. Another Republican state. Four of the six were Republican-leaning states or solid red states. And that just blew my mind. How could this be? What's going on here? Why are these six communities leading and getting to 100% renewables? Well, it turns out, Sierra Club helped with this too, that they are all served by utilities that they own. Every single one of these communities served by utilities that they own. I did the probability, I'm a geek, so I did the probability analysis on that. What are the chances that these six would all be consumer owned? And um, you, if, if you know that one in four Americans is served by a either a muni or co-op, it's pretty easy to get to that one fourth times one fourth times one fourth, six times, comes to one in 4,096. That's the statistical probability that that would actually happen. So it's the business model, right? We know it's the business model. It works better. And one more factoid, there are three utilities that are leading, three large utilities that are leading in getting to clean energy. They are the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, the LA Water and Power District, and Seattle City Light, all of them consumer owned utilities, municipal public power utilities. You are on the right path. I'm here to tell you, and I'm, glad, I'm proud to be with you here today and we'll talk more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That, uh, I have a question now for Michelle. Uh, Michelle, thank you very much for joining us. And the question is, how have the increasingly evident effects of climate change affected your commitment to public power? All right. I'm a former teacher, so I'm also going to get up. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we don't do anything uh, in six years before the end of the century, uh, before the kids who are currently in middle school graduate from high school, we will have used up our entire global carbon budget to avoid passing 1.5 degrees Celsius of change, the Paris Climate Accord Agreement. Um, we're going to hit temporary overshoot almost certainly before that, you know, possibly uh, it's happened regionally, it could happen globally as soon as next year. So, um, you know, this moment is absolutely crucial. Crucial. We can't just get to what they call net zero emissions. We've got to transition off of renew, off onto renewable energy and off of oil, gas, and coal urgently, immediately now. There can't be any new investments in oil, gas, and coal, which is what DTE, by the way, is partly uh, in a major way all about. Um, so. The, the solutions, can't we can't just rely on one solution. We need many solutions. And at the federal level, we got to stop $80 billion a year in federal fossil fuel subsidies. What are we doing? 
We need a windfall profits tax. We need the administration to declare a federal climate emergency. And then they use those powers, those substantial statutory powers in order to address the climate emergency with the urgency it needs. You know, the UN Secretary General, uh, he started calling it a climate uh, crisis. Then he progressed to climate emergency. Last week, he called it a climate breakdown, and he is absolutely right. That's where we are. So the other piece of this is public power. And, uh, you know, we had a big um, breakthrough in New York State recently, right? With, uh, I think it's a Build Renewable Power, a renew Build Renewable Public Act. Um, and it will help with the transition to public power. Um, and it will mandate a much faster uh, movement to renewable energy. But the only reason it's possible is because there is a statewide public energy entity as well as a private one. So people could vote and people could enact that transition to renewable energy at a rate that's much, much uh, more in line with what we need to you know, avoid the really serious future that we're facing for our children, our grandchildren, and for us too, because a lot of the impacts of the climate emergency are happening faster than a lot of scientific modeling uh, and the UN had thought it would. So, um, and I don't, I really wanna uphold what's happening in Maine and the work that Seth and the other people at Pine Tree Power Initiative are doing. I travel the country in my role, lucky to get to do that. I talk with the people everywhere. People are aware, people are energized, people are inspired. So even now, before it passes, and we're gonna make sure it passes, um, they've already made a difference. So thank you, and it's so awesome being here with all of you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, Worsening effects of climate change, uh, driven largely by the dirty practices that utilities like It seems that their infrastructure is now unable to handle the problems that their practices have created. How do you see public power reversing this trend, both in terms of how we are contributing to the problem of climate change, but also how we're standing up to it from a resiliency perspective? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Thank you, Greg. Um, so, uh, you know, just like I was saying earlier, this this is our solution, right? Uh, the, the utilities want to extract profits. They are a profit extraction engine. That's their priority. Their priority is not clean air. Their priority is not to curb climate change. Their priority is to take money out of your po pocket and to pay their CEOs more, and actually more importantly, to send as much possible money from your pocket to Wall Street as possible, meaning that they are going to reduce the amount that they actually you know, put into the grid to make your grid more resilient to the impacts of climate change. And so very fundamentally and simply, what we are proposing is a system where zero, and I always say this to people because there, I came into politics in 2010, that's when I first ran, and boy, there was a real movement afoot of people that loved to talk about how government isn't efficient, government isn't efficient, so we need to privatize everything, let's privatize everything that we possibly can. Well, I'm here to tell you that government is more efficient than the private sector, okay? And something that we don't think about a lot Government is more efficient than the private sector. Why do I say that? Because government doesn't have CEOs that are paid three and four and five million dollars. That's an efficiency. We get to save on CEO pay. Government doesn't have multi one point one billion dollars in profits to Wall Street, not Main Street. That is a one point one billion dollar inefficiency in our current system. So talk about efficiency. The public sector is more efficient because we get to take that $1.1 billion and actually invest it in a more resilient grid. We get to spend, what, what would happen if we in the, in the DTE service area spent $1.1 billion annually to harden our grid? Can you think of how much of an impact that would make? $1.1 billion just in DTE to invest in solar and wind and geothermal. Can you imagine the type of impact that that would make? And that's annual. 
year after year after year, that investment staying locally. And that's on top of the investments that are already being made in the grid. So when you think about the two models and the reason why the investor-owned utilities aren't moving us in the right direction, there you have it. It's profits or people. It's profits or environment. It's profits or clean air. It's profits or clean water. And right now, profits are winning. And we can't let that to, we can't allow that to continue. We have to put an end to it. We have to create our municipal power system here in Ann Arbor. And the other thing I wanna say about that is what we are doing here is having a regional and potentially statewide impact. I have heard from other um, elected officials, local government officials from other parts of our region that have said, hey, I love what you're doing in Ann Arbor. I wanna do it in my community too. Westland, one of the city council members came out to me and said, I wanna I want to create a regional authority where we can provide power to the whole region. Okay, there's this is a movement that is building and we are starting here in Ann Arbor. People in Ypsilanti, Ypsilanti elected officials are like, hey, can we get in on that? Everybody wants, they see the problem with the system, even local elected officials, and they are starting to see that this is the solution. We need a municipal utility here in Ann Arbor to help initiate that domino effect across the state. I will, I will just say though quickly too, when I was in Lansing, I did introduce a bill, a la Maine, right? <laughs> Where it was one of the last uh, bills that I introduced and it was HGRY, so I feel like, you know, yo, why? Here we are, that's my name. Uh, and HGRY, what it would do is it would take all of the assets of consumers in DTE by eminent domain and create a statewide public utility. HJRY, look it up. And some people ask me why, no pun intended, why are you doing this? What, you know, this seems like, it's like impossible, right? How are we gonna, it has to go to a vote of the people. It's a constitutional change. It seems like too, too out there. Politics is a lot like sports. I know the Lions, the Lions win. Are they up? They're losing? They're up, okay, good. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a football analogy. Uh, when you're trying to win in football, you don't run for a first down. You run for the end zone and hopefully you get a first down. So when I'm introducing bills like that, I'm running for the end zone and hopefully we get a first down. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, Seth, the next question is for you. Can you tell us a little about the main feasibility study and what were some of the issues that uh, uh, may be unexpected or that were difficult to manage and how you managed it and what your advice might be for us? Sure. Since we are going to get a feasibility study. Okay, great. So um, just quickly, uh, a refresher. So we're just talking about taking back the poles and wires in Maine, um, and, I, and it is taking back, right? We give these monopolies the privilege of a monopoly. You do it here, we do it there. It's a privilege. We can take it back at any time. That's a really important principle here. Um, and uh, when I was, I was, I was in office, uh, served on the energy committee, was the um, House Majority Leader and Assistant Leader, took two years off, and then I came back and I chaired the Energy Committee. In 2019, I introduced a bill that, uh, like uh, HGRY, would have uh, cr essentially taken back these th this monopoly privilege from both of our large investor and utilities, making the entire state either cooperative or public power. And that initial uh, proposal got a lot of traction. We had huge support, even bipartisan support, in part because we have a utility that's a lot like yours. Um, we have the most, as a state, we have the most frequent outages in most years. Uh, we have right now the fifth highest rates and we have the worst customer satisfaction. Our two utilities have the worst customer satisfaction in the nation in most years. And there was also a lot of frustration about the way they were lobbying the legislature under the previous Tea Party governor and Republican trifecta, pushing back on rooftop solar, pushing back on efficiency and so on. So we had some traction. 
I introduced this bill and our governor who um, at the time is a Democrat, was, was a Democrat then, still is, but is um, pretty conservative, uh, was not comfortable moving forward with the overall proposal, but we felt we could accomplish a, a feasibility analysis. So we managed to get consensus on bringing forward a bill to have a feasibility analysis. We allocated a half a million dollars for the PUC, our Public Utilities Commission, to go out and procure a feasibility analysis, cost benefits, is it legal, any legal or constitutional issues. And a year later, we got it back. What it said, um, really, if you read to the core of it, was yes, this will likely save us money. We might see rates, but just a little bit at first, and then continue downward um, ad infinitum. So that was good news, right? And then the other piece that it said was, yes, this is legal. Yes, this is constitutional. And here's some ways to make it better. But when I say that, I'm distilling the feasibility analysis. Because if you really read the whole thing, and I think it's about 45 to 50 pages long, but there's a lot of um, there's a, there's a lot of language about risk and uncertainty. And I expect that you will see that in your feasibility analysis. The consultants who do this work they also do a lot of work for the investor-owned utilities. They also don't want to be held accountable if you know they advise X and you do X and then it doesn't go so well. So um, you will find that most of the consultants who do this work will hedge their bets and they will say, and they certainly did with us, you know, uh, we think it'll look like this, but it could be, you know, twice as expensive. It could be twice as cheap. Um, we think that this is legal, but the utilities may try to tie it up in court and they might argue X, Y, Z, right? So there's a lot of this, um, you know, can't say for sure, um, gee, I don't really know. And so um, that was one of the takeaways is you really do have to, first of all, expect that kind of language and um, and be ready to beat back against it. So, so that's one piece. Another uh, concern that we had was what was the time frame? We really wanted at least a 30 year lookout because as you're paying, it is as, as Senator Irwin said, you're, you're paying a mortgage instead of a rent and you are going to pay less. I've, I've looked at the numbers. I've looked at case studies around the country, Winter Park, Florida, Jefferson County, Washington, um, Messina, New York, Long Island, New York. Every single time that this is done, you save money. Rates go down, service improves, right? So, you know, that's what the track record said. But the utilities and and their consultants, um, and they will also hire their own consult consultants to to you know give their angle. Um, they will tend to say, "Gosh, no, too much risk." Um, and even the the feasibility analysis uh, for for us, and I expect for the city of Ann Arbor, uh, will likely talk a lot about those uncertainties and unpredictability. So, just be ready for that. But the, the sorry, the thirty year the thirty year window is important because as you're paying off the mortgage, um, you'll see some savings, but not as much. But then what happens, right? Then you paid it off. Then you own the home. Then you can give it to your children and your children's children, right? So building equity and building wealth in your community, investing in your community is so much a part of this. And this, you know, whatever your study comes back with, and ours did say, you know, rates would go up and then down. Um, remember, beyond that 30-year window, once you've paid off the mortgage, then you really see massive savings. So um, I would I would definitely look to that. And I would expect DTE to hire its own consultant and say, you know, the city got it all wrong. You know, whatever the city's consultant says, it's actually much worse and really work hard to push that message out. So you should all just um, be ready for, you know, some spin uh, you know, on the part of the utilities and on the part of uh, city councilors who may be opposed. Um, our governor sort of, you know, cherry picked uh, some of the language in our study to justify what was ultimately a veto of my second bill. Um, and, and just quickly, I'll tell that story. So we got the feasibility analysis back. I came back the, in the next legislature with another bill uh, to do the same thing. We made some tweaks. We called it the Pine Tree Power Company. And that bill passed the House and passed the Senate with mostly Democratic, but even a handful of Republican votes. We got a bipartisan majority in the House, a bipartisan majority in the Senate. Part of the secret to that is we have public financing for House and Senate, and it works. So there were people who were, you know, I really think that was the key. That was the key.
So if you can get public public financing here, I strongly encourage it. It makes a huge difference. We've never elected a governor using public financing. The system's not robust enough. So maybe that's part of the reason. Um, I'll just conjecture there. Uh, we didn't get the governor's support, and ultimately that bill was vetoed to where we are now, which is uh, we went out, we gathered 80,000 signatures, and we put it on the ballot. So 51 days from now or sooner, the uh, the people of Maine will be able to vote on whether to do this ourselves. But feasibility analysis is important. And I know I'm excited for you and uh, also encourage caution and uh, and be ready to critique it and, and uh, get some experts in the room to talk about um, the case studies. Again, Winter Park, Messina, New York, we, you know, we, we know that this works and we know that Ann Arbor is a lot like those communities. So I would encourage you to point to the actual examples and say, you know, we don't need to conjecture. We don't need to listen to so-called experts. You know, let's talk to Randy Knight in Winter Park. Let's talk to people who have actually done this. And that's the best proof. This is a proven model. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seth, for those uh, that fantastic advice and perspective on uh, what you've gone through and what we'll be going through very soon. Um, it's expected that the feasibility study for Ann Arbor, uh, this has just recently come to our attention, should be coming out uh, either this next week or early the week. Uh, having a little bit of mic issues, it seems, but other than that, uh, yes, we'll be going into that fight very soon. Um, and now I want to hand it over to Jeff uh, Jeff, we've just heard a decent amount about the feasibility study, but could you go into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts? How is it that we'd actually pay for this? You know, it's kind of the classic question. Sure, it'd be great, but isn't it going to cost a ton of money? And how do you actually afford to do something like this? Yeah, I'm sure I'm not going to uh, cover every technical issue, but maybe just some of the major ones that I hear as questions from folks uh, and, and, and keying into this very specific question you asked is like, how do, how do we pay for it? And I think that the most important point to be made is we're already paying for it. That's that's the most important point is that rate payers in Ann Arbor are already paying their bills every month and that those bills pay for the entire system and all the money that DTE has borrowed to create and maintain the system and all of the profit and other things that they invest in that we wouldn't have to as a public power authority. So how will we pay for it? We already are because it's gonna be cheaper to run a public power authority. Why is it cheaper? Some of the efficiency reasons that I offered earlier. I also mentioned earlier that the cost of capital is lower. The city can simply borrow at a lower rate. And the fact that you don't have to pay for the outrageous executive salaries and the outrageous lobbying efforts that Yusuf Rabi was talking about, that's a savings. When you add all that up, you know, that's why I've been saying for years, this is a real opportunity for us to have not just more reliable and greener power, but also to have cheaper power. So how do you pay for it? We're already paying for it. All right. And to get a little more, a little more detailed about it, uh, how would we pay for it? Well, the city would have to borrow money. They would have to bond to purchase the assets that uh, would be required to distribute electricity around the city. And uh, there would be a big fight about how much those assets were worth. But at the end of the day, the city would borrow money and we would pay off those bonds in the exact same way that DTE is currently paying off the bonds that they issued, the borrowing that they engaged in, in order to pay for everything that's happening now. So it's really not all that different. Instead of having a private entity borrow money to meet the electricity provision needs of the community and have the community pay back full freight of that borrowing and the interest and all the other costs. Instead, we would just have the city be the entity that is borrowing to do all the same things. And also, by the way, borrowing at a lower cost, right? So that's a big part of it. The other piece that I hear that is a somewhat technical question that I can offer a, a somewhat technical answer to is, you know, well, where would the electricity come from, right? Uh, DTE has power plants. We don't have power plants here in the city of Ann Arbor. So where would it come from? It's a question I hear all the time. And, um, we would acquire, it's the same answer. We would acquire electricity the same way DTE does. Let me give you a really current example. Right now, uh, the state of Michigan gets about 15% of its power from nuclear energy. And right now, the Fermi reactor is down. It's not operating. So how is it that DTE is matching capacity and load when a huge, massive generator of theirs is offline? They buy the power from 
MISO. They buy the power from the grid that Seth was talking about earlier that is connected all over the country. So right now, DTE is short on juice. They're buying it from MISO. We would buy our power from MISO. That's the answer. And th that's how municipalities do it right now. That's Have you noticed that Chelsea doesn't have a power plant? Chelsea has a municipal power authority. They buy their power from the grid and they provide it to their residents. We would do the exact same thing. In addition, though, what would it do is it would unshackle the opportunity for citizens to be able to engage in more power generation here at their home or business. Because then the decision about whether people the decision about whether or not people could put rooftop solar on their home and how big of an array they could put up and whether they could plug in or not wouldn't be made by the shareholders in Wall Street. That decision wouldn't be made by the board of directors at DTE. That decision would be made by the board of directors of our municipal authority, which would be ultimately accountable to the voters. And so what I think would happen, what I think would happen is I think that this city would embrace a system where the public power authority could accept energy from a broad range of customers that were generating on their rooftops in their neighborhoods. I think also the city would probably invest in some local generation, some local medium sized solar arrays that could generate some meaningful power. It would maybe also enliven the conversation around using some of the hydropower that could be generated from the Huron. I think that's a pretty minor piece, but I think that what it would do is it would really allow this authority to explore some of these local generation options. But the basic answer to the question is the first one I offered. We would buy the power from the MISO grid, just like Marshall does, just like Chelsea does, just like Grand Traverse Cherryland Cooperative does, just like the city of Holland does, just like Wyandotte does, and just like DTE is right now where they're, when their biggest generator is offline. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, Yusuf, I have a question for you. Both, I think everything that we have heard today says that DTE and at least some representatives are acting against public interest. How do we create more awareness of this? How do we build more support for A to P2? More support meaning more than 60%. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I just want to build off of something that Jeff was saying too, and emphasize, you know, I, I think the the way that I see things to some degree with this is yes, in the initial term, because this, you know, the municipal utility would need time to ramp up some of the production. In the immediate term, you would need to buy power from the MISO grid. But over time, I think the idea is to make some investments that are city owned you know, power generation that are, uh, you know, renewable energy. And I think that's, that's kind of part of the vision here of what, you know, what, what we're trying to accomplish. And this, like Jeff alluded to, the city already has some energy generating capacity that we are already set it selling to the grid at a loss, basically, for, you know, to DTE. So we already generate some power as citizens that we sell back to DTE and don't recuperate what we could if we used it on our own system. Um, so to the question, uh, this is a movement that has, that we, Jeff and I, I feel like we're kind of, uh, you know, there at the beginning and we have seen this group of people grow every time there is an event. Like, I think I counted over hundred people in the room today. Uh, that's incredible to have this kind of turnout, uh, round of applause for all of you again, for showing up. This is awesome to have all of you here and to be part of this, um, and we have our comrade councilman that showed up too from Pontiac. I was talking about other elected officials being supportive. So thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we have we have regional support, you know, for, for this initiative. And I was talking earlier about how if we can do this here, we can, you know, partner, we can create, you know, new and 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 you know, power for you know, cities all across our region. So, um, and and so that's part of the movement building too. It's movement, how do we movement build here in Ann Arbor? How do we movement build regionally? How do we movement build across the state? And some of what um, Seth was talking about, I think is really powerful in that regard. But I think a lot of this is about like so many other campaigns. It is about the conversations that you have with your next door neighbor. 
because there's a hundred people in this room and you all have uh, 200 neighbors if you have a neighbor on either side. Uh, and so you can talk to your next door neighbor. Then just, you know, let's set a small, you know, easy achievable goal. Talk to the neighbor on either side of you at home. Have this conversation. Say, hey, last weekend I was at this public power event. Have you heard of A2P2? Do you know about what they're trying to do? It's about hosting a yard sign. I'm a big yard sign fan. Lauren knows that already. You still owe me 15 yard signs. Uh, and you can deliver them anytime. Uh, and <laughs> or I'll pick them up here. Uh, and so put a yard sign up. That's really important. It shows your neighborhood. It shows your neighbors this is really uh, a, a big deal. This is really important. Um, I know Chai was going around the neighborhood uh, trying to get everybody's yard signs up. So thank you for that. Uh, a lot of yard signs in my neighborhood. Uh, but it's it's that's a big part of this too. So it's talking to your neighbors. It's putting up yard signs. It's making a contribution. That's something we haven't talked about today. But it's making a contribution, whatever you can afford. Maybe it's five bucks. Maybe it's five hundred bucks. Become uh, a member of uh, of A2P2. Um, the, you know, I, I became a member. How many members in the room? Raise your hand. How many future members in the room? Raise your hand. <laughs> nice. Okay. So donate, make a contribution to A2P2 to make this uh, make this happen. Contact your elected representatives. Obviously, we had Jason here. We have Jeff here. Uh, there are a lot of other elected representatives uh, at the city level, at the, uh, you know, we have Ernesto, too, from the school board. We have school board members. Talk to them. Talk to your elected officials. Let them know how important this is to you. State reps, state senators. Ann Arbor now has four state reps. Um, talk to your state rep. A lot of them are tend to be more supportive of this, but they need to hear from you to really solidify that position, to get them to show up like Jason did at our events. This is how we movement build. It's person by person. Y'all remember, I won my first election by one vote, right? So that's what it's going to take. It's that kind of energy. It's I'm going to talk to that one other neighbor before the sun goes down. I'm going to go canvassing. I'm going to host a uh, Gus. Gus, you're big on the house parties. I've been to a lot of them. So if you want to have a house party, I'll come to your house. Uh, and uh, you better have good snacks, though. Um, but let's talk about public power with your neighbors. Um, you know, that's how you movement build. This is a grassroots effort. This is not top down. This is all of us in this room, again, joining shoulder to shoulder to make this happen. And it's a lift that we all have to play that little part in. Again, maybe it's just talking to your neighbor. Maybe it's making a contribution. But we all have a part to play to make this a reality in our community. Thank you once again for those inspiring words, Yusuf. Uh, the next question I have is for Michelle. Um, as the costs of renewables have continued to decline over the years, we've seen that the investor-owned utilities, rather than having embraced them, have instead pushed against them and lobbied against them. What causes this type of behavior? Why is it that despite the uh, lowering prices that uh, these types of utilities don't want to embrace these uh, power sources? That is such an excellent question. Like. Everything you're taught in Econ 101 is that they should embrace this lower cost way to generate electricity. Why don't they? Well, we've already heard from you know every, all the panelists here, from Senator Irwin and Commissioner Robbie and 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 Seth uh, about money, right? And you think the reason they're acting the way they are is because of money. And you think, well, why don't they want to make more money? Well, there's a couple of things here. It's crony capitalism. And if you've got a solid way to make money, you don't really want to embrace change because that might threaten the stability of the way you're making money. And there's another problem, which is the inher inherent problem to market capitalism, corporate capitalism, which it is that it is short-term focused. They're focused. They're, the CEOs are rewarded based on, you know, what they do annually or even quarterly. Sometimes it seems like weekly if you follow the media, um, and that's an inherent strength of public not-for-profit power. It can look longer term. It can plan ahead. It can say, uh, you know. Renewable energy is going to take a big upfront investment, but we're looking at five years. We're looking at seven years, not just at what I'm going to get my big bonus for as a CEO based on our next quarterly report. So I think all of these um, are some of the reasons that they are resisting it. And the other piece of it is something I mentioned before, 
those huge fossil fuel subsidies. You know, a lot of uh, the fossil fuel companies and, and the energy companies, the electricity producers depend upon them. Um, they've been economically unviable at various points. When uh, gas prices, uh, production prices have spiked and so on, or have spiked on the international markets, and they've been propped up by fossil fuel subsidies. So this goes to another thing that's happened, which is a great thing coming out of DC, and another reason why this moment is so crucial for uh, the public power movement is that there are clean energy tax credits and they're substantial. And Sierra Club, again, has done a terrific report. I think you can just Google uh, direct ta tax credits, Sierra Club, uh, public power. You'll find a very long, very detailed, very technical and excellent report on it. Those uh, clean energy tax credits have been fully available to for-profit uh, ener uh, energy uh, utilities. They have not been to nonprofit municipal ones. Now they are, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, thanks to the Biden-Harris administration and great work by our um, some of our representatives in Congress. You can guess which party they belong to. Jeff, the next question is for you, and it's about energy justice. And the question is, how would the A2P2 campaign strengthen and improve energy justice outcomes? Well, I think there's a, a couple obvious ways that come to mind immediately. Uh, one is that, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, there are people in Ann Arbor who struggle to pay their bills. There are people in Ann Arbor who have to choose between buying medicine or putting food on their kid's table. And um, one of the great things that would be an opportunity for our community if we had our own municipal electricity authority is that we could more directly invest in the needs of communities that are struggling economically. We could reach out to communities where um, you know neighborhoods uh, uh, have lower wages on average than other parts of the city. We could reach out to seniors on a fixed income and make sure that we had special programs that were directly meeting the needs of those people in a way that would really matter and work for our local concerns like only we understand and know. And so um, I have to have I have to give this speech a lot in Lansing because people in Lansing have this view of Ann Arbor that is not real. And they don't understand that... Um, we have poor people in Ann Arbor and we absolutely need to be looking out for them. And that's one of the reasons why whenever I come to these events, uh, I love talking about the important aspects of climate change. I love talking about how we can have more reliable power, but I always really try to stomp my feet on how the utilities are making a ton of money here. And that if we are able to bring those resources back to our community, we can invest them in a way that great that does a better job of serving our goals around justice and serving the needs of, of all people in our community, especially those who are who are struggling with poverty. Um, so that's a big part of it. And then the other thing that comes to mind immediately is what um, Yusuf was talking about earlier, which is that you know because of decisions that were made a hundred years ago, uh, communities all over Michigan are shackled to these investor-owned utilities. Communities all over Michigan who might like to invest in and take advantage of cheaper renewable power are instead being required to pay for more expensive power because that's what really allows the utilities to drive value and profit for their shareholders. And so uh, if we can be the ones that take on the big sharp horns of this incredibly powerful monopoly that was granted this power by the people 100 years ago, if we can be the ones that show that it's possible. That makes a big difference for other communities across the, the the state who are looking for these opportunities, whether it's Ypsilanti or Pontiac or Detroit or wherever else, right? Because the biggest thing that I think we're up against with this campaign is that even here in Ann Arbor, even in a community that's very progressive, even in a community that that believes in innovation and 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 where we've got this amazing university where they're developing, you know, these amazing things and and where the impossible happens all the time. I mean, think about some of the impossible things that they do now at this hospital all the time, right? Even in a community like that, our biggest problem is a lack of belief. 
our biggest problem is that when you bring up this idea, a lot of folks, even folks who might naturally be supportive of good, progressive, innovative ideas say, you know what, gosh, is that even possible? It just seems so big. How can we take that on? And they don't believe it's possible. Right. And so that's why it's so important that we put up the signs. That's why it's so important that we talk to our couple of neighbors. That's why it's so important that we speak out on social media. And when somebody says, I don't know if this is possible, we say, yeah, it is. They're doing it in Lansing. They're doing it in Winter Park. Look at the successes they've had. Yes, this is possible. And so by being the community that does that, that can also serve our goals around justice by spreading that belief and that message and that opportunity to some of these other communities that might not be able to make the big investment in the lawyers that are going to be required to fight the utilities when they find out they can't beat us at the ballot box and they try to beat us in the courtroom. Thank you so much, Jeff. And now I have one final question for Seth Barry as part of our prepared question section. And then after we, um, if you have not already submitted, uh, um, Ernesto, where's the question box? Ernesto is going to collect your questions. So feel free to hold on to them. If you've already written them down, we'll also use the Q and A. So just be ready for that. Um, but the final question here for Seth, Seth. <laughs> Why, so you, you've spoken about this a little bit, but, you know, to kind of put a little bit of a bow tie on our whole event, you know, this idea that power is part of the climate change thing has been, why is it that you really believe that this is the answer to solve main issues with the climate transition? Such an important question, and I actually want to start with something that we will not have access to in Maine, that you will which is that ability that Michelle just mentioned to access direct pay. You know, I gave examples of six communities in the U.S., the first six to get to 100% renewable electricity a moment ago. All of them served by either munis or co-ops, public power or cooperatives. They did that without the benefits of a level playing field. Investor and utilities had tax credits of 30% and were still not able to go toe to toe with those smaller, mighty public power and cooperative communities. And now the playing field is level. So now you have access to that 30% benefit that the investor and utilities didn't, right? That's huge. That is, abs that is a game changer. And you're going to see even more leadership from public power and from cooperatives as a result of that. So yes, thank you, Biden-Harris administration. Thank you, Democrats. You did that. And the Inflation Reduction Act is huge also for rural cooperatives. You're going to see rural, Midwestern, heartland, conservative community cooperatives going forward, gangbusters with clean energy because of the immense money that's also made available to co-ops. Public power and co-ops are leading the way now, and they're going to just take that into warp speed in the near future. Just watch. If you have it here in Ann Arbor, you will have access to it because you will also be able to make a play in generation. Um, Michelle mentioned that New York recently did that with the Build Public Renewables Act. Huge move there. What we're talking about in Maine is just the grid. So my answer is going to be a little different. Um, and we, I'm going to subtract that piece from Maine. But guess what? It still matters enormously that we're talking about just the poles and wires. Why? Because, as I said, they are the lifeline to that livable planet, a monopoly system. And if you own that monopoly system and can plan the grid to suit your purposes, to maybe engage in a little self-dealing with some of your affiliates in other states who are involving in, involved in generation, to build highly, um, highly profitable transmission lines to nowhere that happen to have a, a weird, obscure federal subsidy, then you're going to do that. And you're not going to focus on what really counts. What really counts is that your customers trust you, that your customers can afford you, and that your customers can rely on you. Let me talk about what that means. If your customers don't trust you, don't believe that you're making decisions in their interests, then as a, as a utility, when you wanna put up a big new transmission line that you know, it might have some, you know, it might, it might go through some backyards, it might you know, piss off some, some rich people in some areas, but you need that transmission line to actually get the clean energy to the communities, that's important. And 
if people don't trust you, then you won't get it through, right? So there's a really fundamental piece here of just knowing that the 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 board of that utility, the 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 folks who represent that utility are in fact doing it for the right reasons. If you trust the utility, you'll be better off when it comes to grid planning, which does involve hard decisions from time to time. That's one. Can you afford your utility? That's important from an environmental and economic justice perspective, right? There are people here in this relatively wealthy community in Ann Arbor that can't find affordable housing right now. Well, guess what? Energy costs are a big piece of that. We did a study in Maine recently, not a wealthy state, by the way. Um, people who are at or below the federal poverty level in the state of Maine, which is dirt poor, by the way, federal poverty level is dirt, dirt poor, at or below the federal poverty level are paying a quarter of their income on average for energy. Now that includes that includes uh, you know, gas in the tank and oil in the furnace. We mostly use heating oil, sadly, um, and electricity. It's all of those combined. But a quarter of your income, if you're making 16,000 and you're trying to raise two kids, leaves you only 12,000 for everything else. Food on the table, health insurance, you know, unexpected bills, the phone bill, et cetera. So um, that is a massive, what we call energy burden. And if you look across the country, the same thing is true. The same pattern is true elsewhere. Um, actually, since that study, that was 2019, energy costs have skyrocketed. So it might be 35, 40% on average, meaning a lot of people are paying more than that, by the way. So my point here is that the energy burden falls dramatically, um, it's dramatically regressive. It falls much harder on the shoulders of those who can least afford it. And if we're going to get everyone there to clean energy, guess what? We need to make that clean energy more affordable. It has to be cheaper. You want people to you know, buy a Tesla or buy an EV. Um, you you want to make sure that they know that that pencils out for their household. They're a UAW EV. All right. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. Bring it, bring it. Um, yes. And if you want people to be able to afford a heat pump, um, or maybe, you know, if you want the, the numbers to pencil out on an all electric building that's not hooked up to gas, it's, you know, affordable housing for people here in Ann Arbor, you want to know that they're going to be able to pay that utility bill. So, so can you, can you trust it? Can you, afford it and can you rely on it? Mainers also need to be able to rely on our electricity. Just like you, we have incredibly frequent outages. And it's a little harder to know that you're gonna be able to get to work in your EV or that you're gonna be able to heat your home in the dead of winter um, with your heat pump or that you're gonna be able to you know, uh, work through broadband uh, or learn through broadband um, you know, because the internet also needs electricity. All of these things depend on a grid that's reliable. So people don't, um, trust the grid to be there for them. If they don't, if they no, don't know they can rely on it because of the outages, then we will have a much harder time electrifying. And it's not just about bringing clean energy onto the grid. It's not just having solar farms and wind farms and storage. It's also that choice, that consumer, individual consumer choice, to electrify. So is it one more device that doesn't use fossil fuels and does use clean electricity? That's a critical piece here. So this is what Maine is mostly about. The, the reason we're switching, hoping to switch, and we'll see where it goes. Um, we're being outspent probably 50 to one right now. Um, it might be 100 to one. We figure that if it's 75 to one, we win. If it's, uh, <clears throat> if it's higher, we might lose. If it's lower, we, you know, that, that's good. So, um, so stay tuned and donate uh, ourpowermaine.org if you want it, if you have extra money. Um, I'll stop there, but but you have to be able to rely on and trust and afford your grid and and yes, bring on that clean energy. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Seth. We are now going to go into the Q&A section. For those of you who are joining us online, uh, the Q&A feature in Zoom is available. I see someone's already put a question in there. Go ahead and put your questions in there and we'll be balancing them between online and in-person. Uh, but it sounds like we've got our first question already up. Uh, hi, um, I just moved here four months ago from uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, California to here. Uh, I'm pretty old. My both my first job experience was working for uh, Jimmy Carter in his uh, Department of Energy. He's probably the first president who used the phrase greenhouse gases. And uh, 
I worked for his uh, public initiative to uh, an institutional buildings grants program. It's a boring program that retrofitted dozens and dozens of hospitals, universities, and schools, public and private, with energy conservation projects to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. This is a man who was much maligned, and it's a shame that uh, he isn't still on the front line. I would like to, uh, in terms of people's dialogue, I would like her to, to, I would like to call out her for mentioning Bill McGibbon, obviously, uh, who's, who's of the same vintage as, as I am for being on top of this issue. And I apologize for saying this, but I wish uh, this forum would stop uh, dancing around two issues, one of which was that the somehow the Republican Party, even though they did something good in Kansas, is going to solve this problem. Uh, the majority of Republicans in this country don't even believe in climate science. So they're not in the dialogue. And the second thing is, as a public utility, they have, they're have they a monopoly, as you know. Uh, what, what incentive does a monopoly have for improving anything that they do uh, except uh, shareholder uh, profit? I mean, it's just common sense that this is a, a public good. Energy is a public good. And uh, it's a shame that it's been in. So here's my, obviously the fossil fuel industry has been embedded in the DNA of this country, the economy, the culture. It's gonna need major surgery for it to be uh, put back in its place in the ground. And so my question to you is, uh, I live here now in Ann Arbor. I still am confused about part of this discussion. So a couple yes and no questions. Is this question gonna be on the ballot in Ann Arbor? Yes or no? It will, okay. Somebody mentioned something. I, California, believe me, you want to get this on the ballot in order for it to be publicly debated by more than 100 people. You want to get this on the ballot. Second question, I, I think I heard somebody say, I don't know who, that in order for this to pass on the ballot, it needs a 60% vote rather than uh, a, a, a simple majority. Is that true for a ballot? Yes. Okay. Just, just for this type. It's not for all ballot initiatives, but in believe it's in the state law, basically, that constitution that you need 60%. All right. And my last question is, is the workforce of DTE unionized? Yes or no? Yes, that's a great question. And I wanted to talk about it. Uh, and I okay. can respond in length. But yeah. okay, so so the answer is yes. So my question to you is, is that union supporting this initiative? Yes or no? Not at this time. I hope they do someday. Thank you. If I could actually respond a little bit deeper on the union question, because uh, Jeff, thank you for shouting out the UAW, uh, which is on strike. Th this effort from its inception, uh, there have been several guiding principles, I would say, for the whole group and the whole movement as we look to this new entity. And the desire and the intentionality to make sure that this organ that that the public power organization that we create is employees union union workers union line linemen uh, is one of our top priorities absolutely so I just want to be crystal clear about that um, that this and in fact not all of DTE is union right there's a lot of non-union DTE employees in fact it, I don't even know what the ratio is but it may be uh, close to 50 50 a lot of the people that are working on on the ground are union but a lot of the people working in the office are not and I can tell you having worked at the city of Ann Arbor before uh, the Teamsters represent a lot of the city employees, and I, a lot of office staff are also Teamsters. And so looking at, you know, I, I'm not saying that necessarily Teamsters would represent this new organization, but what I'm saying is we could potentially expand actually the number of people that work in, in the provision of power in our region that are unionized by creating a municipal power authority. Wonderful program. Wonderful program. I have a, a question. How does Ann Arbor Public Power relate to University of Michigan non-public power, or they operate in a different system 
Is the university system going to be brought into the public power system? And I want to say also that the power question and the climate question and the war question are all connected. We're in a system that really is exploiting the people for the profit of very small. On Wednesday, the, the United Nations is having a climate ambition summit to deal with the incredible shortfall of ambition to deal with the climate questions. And the next day is the International Day of Peace on Thursday. And in the center of the city on the comments is an open discussion on how the climate, the war, and public power questions all come together and you're all invited to the Ann Arbor Community Commons. But really, how does the university figure in that, which is the elephant in the room whenever you're talking about Ann Arbor? Yeah, I think, Mr. Weber, I think you're absolutely right that this is a very important question. What is the university's relationship to Ann Arbor for public power? And uh, the most straightforward answer I can give you is that none of us really know yet. Uh, the university itself is a customer of DTE, uh, just like all of us are, and uh, they're obviously a huge customer uh, for DTE. They also do generate and have the capacity to generate power here at the university. And from the very earliest days of Ann Arbor for, Ann Arbor for Public Power, you know, I, I've, I know I've said several times in the room that, oh my gosh, if we could get the university to be a part of this, it would turn this from a no-brainer into like a triple no-brainer or something. I, I don't know, but it would be certainly a, a, a great partnership and it would make the move to public power both easier and it would change the economics behind it in a positive way. And so that's why I think it's really important for folks who are members of the university community, either as staff or faculty or as students, to get involved with Ann Arbor for public power and help us continue the conversation with uh, university administration. Uh, obviously, the university has its own whole uh, way of making decisions, and we've been talking to them about this opportunity for them to be a part of public power, how the university itself could save money, how the university itself could further its climate goals uh, even, even more than they can, uh, given their relationship with DTE. And I think that there is some level of interest there. Uh, but as you know, the university is a, a, a tremendous entity, shall we call it. And I, I, and we have not you know, been able to uh, summit the mountain of getting a clear answer from them about whether or not they're going to be in or not in. But it's a very, very important question. And I think that as we get closer to um, you know, getting this feasibility study back, getting a little closer to having the city itself advance its position, uh, then the decision around what the universities can do is going to ripen as well right along with that. And so I do think it's frankly premature for the university to make a decision yet. We've been engaging them, and I would encourage everybody here who is a part of the university community to help us and engage the community or help us engage the university and help us push the university to uh, prioritize answering this question among all the things that the university is is considering. Um, yeah, excellent, excellent, Jeff. Um, and similarly, thinking about um, the county, um, I am the chair of the county's environmental council. Uh, Yousef is an important member of that council. Um, and the county's uh, has passed a climate action plan. And that climate action plan holds the county to uh, get to net zero emissions for its own operations by 2030 and to get to uh, net zero operations for the entire county. That's everything, everyone's homes, it's the city of Ann Arbor, it's the University of Michigan, it's Ipsy and Chelsea and Manchester, for all of that, transit, everything, to be net zero emissions by 2035. Well, DTE, its climate action plan for itself is to get to 80% reduced emissions by 2040. There's an inherent disconnect there, right? So um, from my perspective, um, getting uh, public power in Ann Arbor is a huge chunk, a really, really important piece of getting the county to its climate goals. I just wanted to quickly answer on the university question too, because I have actually met with several of the regents and asked them about this. 
The answer wasn't no. Uh, the answer was actually quite positive. But um, as Jeff said, it's going to take some time for this issue to mature. And it's important and incumbent on all of us to, I mean, the regents are elected officials. Uh, and so it's important for all of us to let them know how we feel about this. Uh, and, and I think it could make a significant impact on, you know, on what, on what we're able to do moving forward. Uh, thank you. I just one comment. If you can keep your questions short, then we'll be able to get to more questions from the audience. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kate. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Michigan. Um, I have two questions. First, I wanted to acknowledge that tens of thousands of people marched in the streets today across the country demanding that President Biden declare a climate emergency. So my first question is for Seth, and it's, um, I'm a woman driven by concrete action, and so how can we phone bank um, and contact Maine voters over the next several weeks before the election? Thank you so much. Go to pinetreepower.org. And I gave another website earlier, but probably the simplest one is pinetreepower.org, and you will be able to donate or take action. Those are two buttons. You take action. You can sign up for one of our phone banks, and you can do that from anywhere. Text banking also. Um, so yes, your time, your treasure makes a big difference, and it really um, could go either way in Maine. Now, I just want to say quickly, if it goes the wrong way, don't lose heart because this is a this is a longer term game. We are all part of we have struck up a conversation that was long overdue. And this may this will take time before the whole country gets there. But we're applying leverage and we saw that leverage work very well in Boulder. So your time is this dedicated to this, even when, you know, it feels like the chips are down or maybe the feasibility study comes in and it's not good. You know, don't give up this. This is tough work, but you know, so was the civil rights movement, right? So was the American Revolution. Like stuff that's that's important can be hard. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It means you got to double down and get it done. My second question is, um, like, when do you foresee what election cycle do you foresee public power being on the ballot in Ann Arbor? And other than the feasibility study, what are some of these key milestones along the way that we can engage with? Sure, I can do my best to answer that. And the honest answer is, we don't really know. Um, so the basic process of where we are now to getting to the ballot is we are uh, soon to be receiving the feasibility study has been referenced quite a few times here. Um, that feasibility study, assuming there aren't major red flags, which there shouldn't be, this is definitely a feasible thing for a city that has the resources of Ann Arbor to do, right? Uh, is to do evaluation study. And that gives the city a number to offer DTE. The state constitution requires DTE to sell their infrastructure to the city if the city makes an offer, right? They don't get a choice in that. However, they can contest the price, right? They can say it is worth way more than you are offering us. And so that is likely a legal battle, right? That it, uh, it will either be settled out of court or through court, but there will be a legal process involved. That is the time period that's a little bit variable. Now, a lot of communities across the country, Winter Park was mentioned, about a two-year battle usually, right? Could be more, could be less. Boulder's also been mentioned. Boulder ended up taking 10 years, right? Boulder made legal mistakes that weren't related to the valuation that led to it being dragged out longer, which luckily you we have a very strong campaign here. We're able to stand on the shoulders of giants. We're able to avoid those types of mistakes, right? Um, but... We are not exactly sure. However, it's reasonable to say that if we can get the city council to move quickly on the valuation study and making the offer and all of these different things, that we could be looking at an election somewhere in 25, 26. Whoa, uh, let me just up for this. Uh, great seeing some of my favorite people in this room. Uh, and seeing the rest of you. So I have a very key and important question. Also, I got here late. So uh, please, you know, let me know if I got it wrong. Uh, also, uh, Pine City Councilman McKinley, also the executive director for Magic, um, which there are some lovely members of our steering committee who are co-sponsors of this event. Um, so coming from the city of Pontiac, uh, we simply do not have resources. Uh, emergency management got rid of every bit of revenue that we'd ever possibly have. 
and DTE, uh, we are still running off of uh, infrastructure that is older or just as old as World War II. So the feasibility of us being able to purchase uh, our infrastructure is just simply not going to happen. Uh, and more or less than that, even if we had the money to purchase the infrastructure, it's not worth paying for. Um, and there are so many different black and brown communities like Pontiac, uh, so I mean, specifically in Oakland County, but also Highland Park, uh, that just this is not a, a feasible thing for us to do the same way that Ann Arbor is. And so my larger question is, how do we make this movement truly uh, intersectional, not just for black and brown communities who are uh, historically disadvantaged, but obviously recognizing that this requires, uh, as people mentioned before, tying this to other issues such as housing, right? There's the Rent Too Damn High rally that happened, the Rent Too High campaign. Uh, yes, please. And there's a huge part of that that's about social housing. And obviously social housing should be built as sustainable and green as possible, which is inherently built on uh, clean energy from public power. Um, you know, having the union labor and the union members who, you know, inherently would likely be working on this grid uh, that we should be bringing in to uh, support this. I guess my large question is, how do we truly make this uh, be able to, you know, a, a fight that everyone can jump into? Because it's it's not really a feasible thing to say like, oh, well, you know, just Ann Arbor. Um, now, I, I have said in this entire campaign, you know, being on the advisory board for A2P2, having passed a resolution in Pontiac, like really pushing for public power. But like when people ask me, how do we get there? I always say, OK, well, we'll probably take Ann Arbor jumping in first uh, and then spreading to Ipsy and then forcing Detroit to get in on board. And then me telling the county of Oakland to be like, hey, all of your communities are tired of having your power go out. Let's have a consortium to be able to have it in Oakland County and get in like a southeast Michigan thing. However, that is a uh, I don't call it a pipe dream, but it is it requires so many different things moving at once, so many different thought processes across so many different areas that outside of Ann Arbor become extremely important. So the question really is, like, you know, how do we truly make this uh, not just intersectional because it already is I think we touched on that how it's important for uh, poor black and brown just really anyone who wants reliable power to have this how do we truly make that you know a, a key and integral part of not only the movement but our messaging for that to be able to make sure that we're doing these things in communities who just don't have the same position as Ann Arbor Yeah, round of applause. That was a great question. So this is something I try to talk about every time we have a forum like this, because this, this is a crucial question. There's a, few, there's a few things I want to say. So the first thing is, it is possible for a municipal utility to include other communities in, in, in its power. If you look at Lansing, East Lansing is a customer of Lansing Board of Water and Light. So Lansing City owns the power and they sell to East Lansing and actually a couple of townships surrounding Lansing. So it's not just the city. So it depends on the community. I don't know what the legal framework is in Pontiac, but it depends on the community whether you know that can be done. I mean, obviously that it's a potential, uh, but you know, probably a better potential for you know communities that are surrounding Ann Arbor. But it's something that could be explored, I think, to see, okay, if we start, if we start something in Ann Arbor, can we sell our, uh, our power to other communities? So that's, or can we, in, in the Lansing example, they actually have those communities sitting at their Lansing Board of Water and Light table too. Uh, and so there's, I think there's ways to be creative with this, with, uh, with, a, you know, municipalization in Ann Arbor. The other piece of it though, too, is, and this is, this is kind of a, a complaint that I have, I guess, a little bit, uh, but, you know, in Michigan, because we have such a strong municipal power presence in communities all over the state, there is actually a statewide um, association of municipal power authorities that gets together. There's there, you know, and they talk about public power policy. That organization has mostly, frankly, been defensive uh, to fight back against the uh, attacks on municipal power authorities. And I think that there's sort of been it seems to me this is not a um, this is my observation only, uh, but it seems to me that there's sort of a detente between the municipal power, uh, you know, uh, organizations and the investor owned utilities that they're not going to go after each other's, uh, you know, uh, setup. 
And so, but I think that if Ann Arbor were to become a municipal, uh, you know, authority, we would be able to participate in that. And I think, I think that there are ways that Ann Arbor can be proactive about going on the offensive and helping other communities that are seeking to do this. Um, and that can play out in the context of the statewide association that we would be part of. And it can play out in, in other ways too. I mean, if you look, if you look at Lansing, uh, Board of Water and Light, they actually transfer annually, I believe it's $25 million a year to the city general fund. Um, so it is actually a revenue source for the city of Lansing. Um, perhaps there's a way that some of that money could be used for uh, helping in other communities to, you know, do do this work. Um, and I think the, the last part of my answer is an organization like A2P2, um, I think once you've created the, uh, the, the framework for achieving this, um, it can be exported to other communities. The activists can go and, and show up in other communities as this movement builds out. And so I think, you know, as, as we stand here, still, you know, a ways off from having our municipal power in Ann Arbor, we should already be thinking about how we, as interested activists in this cause, can start to roll up our sleeves and spread this to other communities. And, and that's what we're already doing, right? Mikhail is here. Uh, we've talked with people in Detroit, in Ypsilanti, in uh, in Westland. There's there's interest all across our state in doing this. So let's build those bridges of solidarity now, and so that the resources and the infrastructure can be there for when the time you know comes that we make the push in Pontiac. This is an all hands on deck movement, and really, again, what we were saying earlier, what we do in Ann Arbor has a statewide implication, which means what we do in Pontiac has a statewide implication, which means what we do in Detroit has a statewide. Implication implication, which means we are all Michiganders. We're all in this together. We're all fighting for one another. And yes, so that's that's my that's my answer there. But the other the other thing I just want to quickly say, building off of something Jeff said earlier, I want to emphasize. And I say this sometimes and people look at me weird, but DTE is a racist organization. OK, and I think it's important that we understand that in the context of this conversation. And, I, and there's a few reasons that I, that I want to be clear about why, why I say this. The first one is I was part of, in the last election, a coalition called the Defend Black Voters Coalition. As you know, there was a series of bills introduced when the Republicans were in control to erode voting rights in the state of Michigan, and that was targeted at black voters. And there were a number of senators and representatives that supported that legislation, and DTE spent our money supporting them. And so at the end of the day, when it comes to anti people of color legislation, when it comes to anti black legislation, DTE has been supportive tacitly of what these legislators have been doing. There's another reason that I say this too, and it's perhaps even worse, which is that, you know, like we were talking, like Jeff was talking about earlier, there's a lot of folks that can't afford to pay their utility bills. There's people that are, I mean, I talk about universal health care all the time, which by the way, we need. Uh, and, and when people are making these decisions, they're deciding, do I pay for my mom's chemo or do I keep the lights on in my house? Why do we have to make decisions like that? That's fucked up, okay? And so when we're looking at situations like this that occur across the state, and we look at the people who simply are unable to pay their bills, who then default on their bills. We learned about a year ago that DTE had the distinction of being the only utility in the Midwest to send those who could not pay their bills to collections, to collections, meaning in the state of Michigan that their wages can be garnished up to one quarter in Michigan. They are the only utility that did this heartless, racist thing that targets those who are already struggling. They already can't pay their bills. And then you're gonna take a quarter of their paycheck away out of their kids' mouths. That's messed up. It's anti-poor, it is racist, and DTE is the organization responsible. And again, only one in the entire Midwest that did that. So when we look to remove ourselves from that, 
we are looking to create a new system that, as Jeff said, is actually looking to create opportunities for people that is not going to punish our, our, our neighbors just because they can't pay. We can create programs that help to lift people instead of push them down. Thanks. Greg, is, is this the final question? Okay. Um, if you didn't get a chance to um, to submit a question, there's a box outside for you to write a question down and we'll try to address them on the website or in a, through our fax. Thank you. That's absolutely right. Thank you, Ernesto. Um, so I apologize. I know we have a lot more questions in the room and online than we were able to get to. Unfortunately, we are time constrained and I do want to give our speakers an opportunity for a final closing word before we end. Uh, do know that we are going to have tables out there. A few orgs are here to table. We also have an art sale of some really cool, uh, you know, climate action art. Absolutely. Um, so stick around. And if you have questions, any of our panelists or I or anyone else involved in the org would be happy to have a discussion with you. Um, and additionally, if you're online and you're not able to uh, attend that, feel free to send us an email, annarborpublicpower at gmail.com, and we will make sure to get you an answer. Um, but finally, I do want to give us, uh, our speakers, a chance for a couple minutes just for a closing remark, uh, starting with State Senator Jeff Irwin. I'll just be very brief and thank you all for being here. If you had questions that you weren't able to ask, uh, you know, please, uh, I know I'll stick around for a little while to try to answer your questions if I can. And, you know, thank you for your curiosity. Thank you for being involved with A2 for Public Power. And before you leave, make sure that, you know, you grab a yard sign or something like that so that you can show your support. Because as I said, I think the biggest thing we're up against here is this sense that, you know, this is just too high a mountain to climb. But we absolutely can summit this mountain. Other communities have and when they've done it they've seen tremendous benefit and our citizens here our residents here in ann arbor deserve the same all right so seth was gonna try to answer the last question and i took all of his time so all i'm gonna say is power to the people and yield the balance of my time Yeah, I'm going to echo that. Power to the people. I'm going to make uh, one quick mention, and then I'll be around to talk about it more with, with y'all afterward. Um, th there is a transformative federal government program going in place that might help Pontiac, certainly might help uh, nonprofits, uh, school districts, libraries. For the first time, the federal government's going to do a direct pay program, uh, tax credits for tribal nations and local governments and school districts and community centers, hospitals neighborhoods who gather together and form an uh, entity to do community solar, to do rooftop replacement and put solar on your roof. Um, and this is another way of getting power to the people in places where we can't get public power right away. So um, please come and talk to me about it or go to the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center, which has a terrific description of their program. And big, can we give a big round of applause to um, Ann Arbor for public power? Like, oh, would you all stand up? Like, come on, you all rock. Come on, stand up, Grant. Come on. Yeah. Lauren. Lauren, come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say this was worth it. Um, <laughs> you all inspire me. Um, I can't wait to, to share. Uh, this conversation with my friends back in Maine, you know, Maine and Michigan have a lot in common. Um, you know, we are northern industrial states, uh, you know, with an industrial history and, uh, you know, have kind of gone Republican or Democratic over the years. Um, and and we are both in a position to really lead and and shine a light for the rest of the country. I am very, very bullish on this movement that we are all part of. And it is a movement. It's not just about the next step, you know, will, you know, will Maine vote correctly on November 7th or, you know, will Ann Arbor do it? We are in this together. And there are others around the country in many other parts of the country who are also working on this and, and we're in it for each other. 
I know some of you are coming to Maine to help us and have already been, raise your hand if you're coming to Maine or going to volunteer in Maine or have donated to Maine. You guys are amazing. This, and thank you so much. Um, and I want to reciprocate. We want to help you and, and make sure that Ann Arbor is successful because, you know, yes, we need to get to Pontiac, but the route to Pontiac is through is going to be through Ann Arbor. That's how you're going to do it. You do have to get it done here. And then, yes, you can expand. And there are many munis that over the years have expanded to one, two, 10, 20 different municipalities regionally. And this is how a lot of these new public power entities that lead the climate change, um, the, the, the climate solution um, will happen. So I am just hugely inspired by all of you. I encourage you to stick with it, to stick together, to give what you can in your time and your treasure to A2P2, um, because this is how we solve the most important existential uh, crisis of our years, of our time and our lifetime. One last, uh, you know, moment where the electricity grid was, you know, arguably as much at, at uh, you know, as much was at stake um, was in the early 1930s. Um, you know, the in the in the midst of the Great Depression, FDR said, you know what, we can work together. Government can be a part of the solution. Government is more efficient. Government can actually apply its immense uh, power of the public purse uh, to make low-cost capital available to farmers because it is unacceptable that 10 and 11 farmers in the United States in this day and age when electricity has already been around since the 1880s, 50 years later, our farmers still don't have electricity. And FDR um, with Congress enacted, and Democrats did this, the Rural Electrification Act, right? And so because of the REA, this low cost capital became available and more than half the countryside didn't have electricity. So the farmers had to, you know, the uh, usually the wives had to spend all day on Sunday doing the wash, hauling the water, heating it up, washing the clothes, hanging them out to dry, right? They couldn't refrigerate their milk, right? They they didn't have access to reading, you know, light light bulbs at night, that sort of thing. So there were just all these uh, amenities that uh, farmers didn't have access to, and it was because of FDR and the Rural Electrification uh, Administration that the countryside was electrified and the co-ops were created. Within uh, two years of the REA being created, the cost per mile to string wire to electrify the countryside came down. Um, by 50%. It was half as expensive to deploy that uh, those those wires, that electricity. And so government can do big things and it sometimes takes time. The farmers have been complaining for a long time, right? But that's that's a moment where a big thing happened and it did take time. And now where the poles and wires are even more important, they're literally the lifeline to our future. We got to do this. So let's do it together. Thank you. All right, we're about to finish up here, but I do want to give one final shout out to Lauren Sargent. Lauren was the force behind this event, tireless organizer, constantly the heart and soul of A2P2. Lauren, go ahead. Um, as, as I mentioned before, this is an official event of the New York March to End Fossil Fuels. So we are with tens of thousands of other Americans around the country demanding that we call an end to the fossil fuel industry now. And the art that is out there is from that show. So please, I do not want that coming back to my garage. Please make uh, whatever you can afford so that it can come home with you and we carry that on. So, and there also, there is time to talk to the other organizations that um, of, have co-sponsored this event. And also there will be pizza at 5.30 for those who hang around and there are some snacks now. So please don't run away. There's lots to do there. Thank you.